Good evening and thank you for joining Krem 2 News at 6 tonight. I'm Mark Hanrahan. Hard to believe, but we are well into our fourth week of social distancing here at Krem 2. So I'm broadcasting from my home. Meantime, our Whitney Ward back at the studio tonight. Whitney. Hi, Mark. Yeah, we want to get right to some breaking news. This just happening here a few moments ago. Governor Jay Inslee signed a proclamation suspending the statute of limitations for all crimes. That means he's waiving the one year limitation for post conviction challenges in criminal cases as well. This all coming in an effort to allow more time for prosecutors to file charges and more time for those convicted of crimes to challenge them amid this coronavirus pandemic. We'll have more on this tonight on Crime 2 News at 10 and 11. In the meantime, yesterday, Governor Jay Inslee announced that he's joining up with the governors of California and Oregon to collectively reopen the West Coast. That group plans to work together to restart the economy in a safe way. Well, OK, but what does that exactly look like? Our political reporter Casey Decker asked Inslee in a one on one interview here just a few hours ago. He joins us now live. Casey. Well, Whitney Inslee has said for weeks that it's so important that we have statewide unity. He's praised Washingtonians for complying with his order to stay home. Many of them surely doing so in hopes that if they comply faster, the state will open faster. I wanted to know whether this new West Coast agreement could cause delays in that timeline outside of Washingtonians' control. Does this new agreement maybe put us in a place where if people, you know, a thousand miles away in Southern California don't comply and there's a new outbreak in San Diego, that could negate all the hard work done here in Spokane and elsewhere? Uh, no, I, that's not something you have to fear. This is, there's no agreement to have the same dates of what other, whatever phase and approach we take. So I think you are going to see states in the West Coast have a similar approach, which is to move to phase two of this what I call smart public health, an individualized approach rather than the blunt instrument that we've used. But I think the dates are probably going to be different, actually. They're going to fit our own, our own circumstances, as you've indicated. Oregon, California, but here we're being so close to Idaho. Is Idaho involved in any way? No, not right now, Winnie, and that's something I asked the governor about as well. Certainly here, Idaho is going to be more impactful to Washingtonians on the east side of the state than California would be. But he says that he and the other governors didn't reach out to Governor Brad Lido of Idaho because he hasn't gotten there the same kind of consensus in his state legislature and generally in the state that the other western states have seen, meaning it could be harder for him to enact the kinds of policies that this coalition is intended to put together, Winnie. Interesting. All right, Casey, thank you very much. We'll check back in on that story later on tonight at 10 and 11 as well. So while parts of North Idaho are reporting coronavirus cases and deaths, some parts of the panhandle appear to be coronavirus free, at least for now. So at last check, Shoshone, Benoit and Boundary County and Boundary counties are not reporting any cases. So Creme 2's Taylor Vido looked into the numbers and asked about testing there. With these beautiful vistas and wide open spaces of Bonners Ferry, it's not surprising to think that social distancing here isn't difficult. And amid a world dealing with a coronavirus outbreak, the numbers appear to back that up. As of Tuesday afternoon, Boundary County hadn't reported a single case of COVID-19. That despite conducting 37 tests so far at the local hospital, according to a hospital spokesperson, 30 tests have come back negative and seven tests are pending. Compare that to the four confirmed cases in Bonner County and 45 cases in Kootenai County. It could be something as simple as these more rural counties could be better protected just because they are more spread out. Of the five northern counties in North Idaho, both Benoit County and Shoshone County haven't reported any cases either. It's worth noting that Shoshone County is along a major interstate and is home to two ski areas, although both shut down last month amid coronavirus concerns. The hospital in Kellogg didn't return a message seeking comment on how many people they've tested, but in neighboring Benoit County, the hospital in St. Mary's has performed 27 coronavirus tests, and at last check, there were no confirmed cases there. Health experts point out that there are tests to go around right now. We don't believe that it is a lack of testing. Um, as of right now, anyone who needs to be tested can be tested. In other parts of the panhandle, however, Lataw County has reported three cases and Nez Perce County has tallied 20 cases and six deaths. Kootenai County has cases of community transmission, but not elsewhere in North Idaho. I think it's great. Um, 
I think people are doing a really awesome job in our district for social distancing. Our curve is not spiking. Um, it's not flat. Um, but we've certainly seen a slowdown to a trickle of cases. With that, however, health experts say it's not time to head out just yet. The wait on official word from Idaho's governor tomorrow regarding the status of the state's stay home order. They want you to keep practicing good hygiene to prevent a potential second wave of cases. Taylor Vito, Grim 2 News. Well, it is considered the largest outbreak at a long term care facility in the county. At least 12 residents have been confirmed for coronavirus at the Spokane Veterans Home, as well as one employee who came to work for several days before showing symptoms. But today, Spokane Regional Health says all of the cases cannot be traced back to that one employee, meaning the virus is spreading in other ways. Officials have now created a task force with other local health care organizations to focus on long term care facilities. I did reach out to the Washington Department of Veterans Affairs and was told that all employees are now able to get tested. The Spokane Veterans Home also working on getting on site testing for its employees and its residents. Domestic violence is a problem that we know is plaguing households all across the country right now. With so many more people stuck at home, resources are necessary to keep victims safe. Creme 2's Brandon Jones explains now how those services will still be available in Spokane despite the closures. For a victim of domestic violence, a stay at home order could be detrimental on their lives. But for organizations like the YWCA, they make it their mission to help these individuals. And with a new Paycheck Protection Program loan, their work will be continued. That we're going to be able to um, ensure that none of our staff have to be laid off. That's over 80 employees that the organization is now able to retain with these funds. So their building is closed, but their services can move forward. That includes free counseling, therapy, and helping victims of domestic violence access protection orders. Uh, but we certainly know that the longer there are stressors in, in any home, um, the probability of uh, violence is, is increased. The loan they're receiving is a part of a federal program to relieve economic pressures of COVID-19. Over the last few days, they've begun to see a small uptick in calls for their service, but a lot of the relief from saving jobs was necessary for their shelters because they're at capacity. Both our city and our valley shelter, both of those are full, so we certainly are seeing um, that there is need there. Before the funds came in, YWCA received critical support from local banks. The loan adds financial security in a time where everything is uncertain. To know that we continue to be available to them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that none of their urgent needs um, have to go unmet. From Spokane, Brandon Jones, Crim 2 News. President Trump says he is halting U.S. payments to the WHO pending a review of its warnings about the coronavirus. President Trump says the outbreak could have been contained at its source and lives spared had the U.N. health agency done a better job of investigating initial reports coming out of China. The president claims the World Health Organization failed to carry out its basic duty and must be held accountable. Tremendous death and economic devastation because those tasked with protecting us by being truthful and transparent failed to do so. President Trump says the U.S. will continue, though, to engage with the organization in pursuit of what he calls meaningful reforms. All right, yesterday, definitely a beautiful sunny day, kind of cloudy today, and now it sounds like the rain is moving in. Tom Sherry joining us once again with a little bit of dancing and weather. Hi, Tom. Well, a little bit, a little <laughs> bit of dancing. We're ready. We're geared up. We're ready. That was my sun dance that oh, I was doing right lovely. there. Oh, lovely. I like and, it. And uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for that. Uh, here's the situation, folks. Uh, the clouds just never kind of went away today. We've got rain moving in. Let me go right over now to the remote weather window, the Creme 2 remote weather window. Let's take an observation out here. And I don't see the wind blowing as much right now, but certainly we've got lots of cloud cover. And our temperature today underperformed. <laughs> this time yesterday, I told you we'd have a high today of 62 degrees. Uh, we only got into the upper 50s, so, uh, which was about seasonal. Matter of fact, you can see our current temperature there at 55 degrees. During our 4 o'clock broadcast, we had wind gusts up to 20 miles an hour. Now we're seeing wind gusts uh, right around, or average wind speeds right around 9 miles per hour. There's some of the rain that's occurring in eastern Washington. Washington and Northern Idaho. And you can see it's not on the west side of the state. We had plenty of sunshine out on the western side of the state and also in central Washington. Looks like we are still going to continue with a chance of some stronger wind gusts through the 
7 o'clock hour, and then you can see the winds really beginning to uh, uh, taper off as we get later tonight and in the overnight period. We'll also see decreasing clouds overnight with a low of uh, 40 degrees under partly cloudy skies, 58 the expected high tomorrow, and I've got mostly cloudy down there with a chance of showers, but I really think it's going to be some uh, parts of the day we'll see sunshine, other parts of the day we'll see cloud cover. I don't think tomorrow will be as cloudy as what we saw today, and we'll see a daytime high of 58. For the weekend, we warm into the mid to upper 60s. Uh, we'll call that continued mild to even warm weather, and coming up in just about 10 minutes, I'll take a look at your 10-day forecast, which includes a 70-degree reading. All the good news on that coming up in a few minutes. All right, Tom, thank you very much. My only regret is I can't see Tom Sherry dancing right now, so maybe I have to look at the tape oh. later today. Oh. All right, in other news, Washington Attorney General Bob Ferguson has filed a lawsuit in Spokane County against Greyhound Lines. Ferguson says it's for allowing U.S. Customs and Border Patrol to perform, quote, warrantless immigration checks on its buses at the Spokane Intermodal Station. Greyhound had previously announced they would no longer allow CBP agents on board without warrants or probable cause, but the lawsuit alleges those searches are still happening. The lawsuit argues that Greyhound's actions violate the Washington Consumer Protection Act as well as the Washington law against discrimination. There is a new app working with large companies like Microsoft to match donations of personal protective equipment to hospitals in need. The app, operated by Health Equip, will match those donating PPE with local hospitals based on needs criteria. Hospitals register and tell the app what they need. The app then determines the allocation of donated PPE based on a combination of what items become available and the need of all registered hospitals. The app is currently web-based. Versions for Apple and Google devices are in the works. Rutgers University researchers have received government clearance for the first saliva test to help diagnose COVID-19. The test initially will be available through hospitals and clinics affiliated with the university. With the new saliva-based test, patients are given a plastic tube in which they spit into several times. They then hand that tube back to the healthcare worker for laboratory processing. The current approach to screening for COVID-19 requires healthcare workers take a swab from a patient's nose or throat.